I'm Richard Corston, redoing composition, and I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Anthony Turnage, Jonathan Woolgar, and um, John Hopkins. Um, we're a little, obviously a little bit late starting, so I'd like to dive straight in um, by asking you, Mark, about this silence. Um, it's based on this devastatingly um, heartbreaking and, and, and honest poem by John Silkin. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to just ask you about its gestation and, and how it all came about. Well, it's, it's a poem that really affected me. It's actually interesting um, in retrospect because it's before I had children. Um, so um, I'm not sure what my frame of mind was then, um, but it was something that I found. I, in some ways, I thought maybe I shouldn't reveal the, the source. Um, both pieces are, are both the pieces in this, you know, this piece, the two, the two poems that, that I um, originally set and then. And then took away the vocal line. So, so I, yeah, it's very funny talking about pieces that are old, because um, I'm getting old now, and I think I wrote this in, 90, in the early 90s, so I can't always remember <laughs> what, what the motto, and I'm always very scared when someone's about to ask me a question about pieces that I think, oh no, do, how did that come about? But I do remember being very struck with that, that those, both the poems, um, and also just um, a lot of my earlier things um, were quite often motivated by literature um, or painting, um, less so these days, but for some reason. So, they, so, and it was a, it was a commission for the uh, Sharoon Ensemble, the Berlin Philharmonic um, uh, Ensemble. So, I, it was quite a, a big thing for me. I remember actually because Patrick Bailey, the conductor tonight, was asking me whether it was conducted. I think I think the premiere wasn't conducted, but. Funnily enough, the workshop was conducted by Brett Dean, who was a viola player at the time. Well, he was a composer as well, but since then has had a really big career. So I've known Brett for a long time. So he, he was involved in this sort of workshop with well, well, I've run through it anyway. So that so I can't really say much so much about the poem, but I remember being affected by it, and it's a, it was in a collection of English poetry. Like so. Is it set for one instrument, or does the the vocal line move between instruments in your? It does. It does um, move between instruments, and I think I don't, I'm not religious with it in the sense that I, I, you know, quite often I have pieces based on poetry, and I don't necessarily set the whole poem. It's it's just sort of a flavour to start off with, and then I probably only set the first verse and then sort of veered off. So you so you can't sort of you know pin it down to exactly the set you know the, the, the setting of that poem, but, mm -hmm. but, but it's definitely the feeling behind the piece. Mm -hmm. Can I ask what the other poem was? Uh, I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I thought you were going to ask me that question. Mm -hmm. It's an Elizabethan, it's a, a metaphysical poem. And mm -hmm. I think it's Henry King, I think, actually. Is it not in the programme? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty really sorry about that. So I'm really a lot of use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a, yeah, so horrible. But it's, mm -hmm. a, it's an old poem. And I said originally for chorus, and again, that got changed. And, and I, so it was a sketch that didn't work, and then I mm -hmm. made it into an instrumental. One thing you do say in the programme notes, you talk about how the piece under, underwent some quite a lot of transformation between the workshop and the performance. And I, I wonder if you could just tell us something about how it, the, the process of, of making the piece and how it reached its final form. Uh, yeah, well, I find it really hard because it, there's, there's a Schubert Octet ensemble, which I think is quite, I found tricky. Um, I think a lot, around that time I wrote a lot of pieces were for bigger forces and I, and I've, I've, I didn't, hadn't written much chamber music um, and so I found it uh, quite a challenge and so I think the first version from when we went over and did it in Berlin, this is a, uh, the run through that Brett Dean conducted and I think that I do remember really largely rewriting it because I got things wrong with the ensemble because it's one of those things where people when they ask you what they're writing, is I had this happened with the piano trio as well. I've written quite a few piano trios, and they say, "Oh, I'm writing a piano trio. Oh, that's really difficult." <laughs> and, they, and when I said to them, "I'm writing a uh, tuba orchestra," oh, that's really difficult. And I was thinking, "Oh no, that's making me feel really bad." I'm there's, starting the piece. There's yeah. a lot of middle in that ensemble. Yeah, there? yeah, it's really hard. It's it's really hard. But I I I found in the end, I think for composers, it's like a, uh, I have this with students because I teach at Royal College. Is that I think you need these challenges. I think you know it can be very safe. I, I can. Not my comfort zone is certain instruments that I love working, I love writing orchestral music, and I think it's really good to say, you know, you can't use. I, I did a piece recently for the LSO which, uh, with, with, with Rattle, and, and he, he insisted that this piece didn't have any violins, it's just viola section. 
in, in the whole orchestra, so there's no violins in the whole piece. And I tried to check it out, and I tried to get him to say, look, I said, please, can I have the violins? And he, and he said, no, just the violas. And, and that was great, so it's violas, cellos, and basses. Did it feel like the heart had been ripped out? Yeah, a little bit. It was just really hard. And But then, I, yeah, then it forced me to write a different sort of piece. And I think, you know, this is a great thing thing for composers to try and get them to, to out of their comfort zone, because it, make, it makes you write differently. That piece is very different from other pieces at the same time. I heard you talking about that piece in an interview, and... Um, you sort of implied, but you didn't quite say that um, perhaps one of the thoughts behind that was that the violas would take on the role of the violins yeah. in the sense that they would become the top line of the strings. Did, yeah. Is that how it It felt? sort of happens, but the other thing about that is that, that, that it, it makes you, it makes them sing more, whereas usually poor old violas, you know, I've written a lot for viola solo, but you know, within an, within an orchestral context, uh, I suppose they're pretty dull. They, they sort of sort of stay around the middle. I don't really make them prominent, and I think that's probably it. It, it just forced me, and I just think that's that's as a composer, as I said, it's 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 good for me. Mm -hmm. Kai, ne next to this silence, Kai is is um, feels like it's on quite a grand scale, um, and it's the thing that struck me about it listening to it in rehearsal just now is it's incredibly clear I mean you can really hear right through the texture <laughs> and it absolutely sings mm. um, can you tell us a little bit about how, how that came about yeah this is an example of where a piece where I did get my own way and sense that I wanted to write for saxes and I want I was very just before I wrote this the Kai um, I started uh, an opera about the jazz double bass player uh, Charles Mingus, which had a really bad libretto. Um, fortunately, it doesn't exist anymore, any, any of it. Um, and I actually, it, it was an abandoned opera, but I had a, about half an hour of music that I liked. So this this is why the sort of there are sort of a references to Mingus, because it was a piece about Mingus's life, which which proved impossible to do in the end. But but um, so I made the piece. So I took sketches from that, and it's, this is how this became. Hi. And also, I got the uh, this started my job at the CBSO with the Composer Association, and um, Uli Heinen, who was the principal cello of the CBSO, wanted me to write a piece with cello and ensemble. So it all sort of came together, and I and I suppose the the, the jazz element is very is featured because there's also the bass guitar, there's a bass guitar, and a sort of drum set, although it's not a traditional um, jazz thing. So that's that's how the piece sort of came about. Mm -hmm. Do you think I could ask Mark a question? I mean, <laughs> just. Yeah. Can you say something about what it was that drew you to the idea of writing an opera about Charles Mingus? Well, it was partly to do with Beneath the Underdog, this amazing autobiography yeah. that he wrote, which is sort of mad. And I just thought that, 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 that he is, his life was so interesting. Um, I mean, he's a great pl uh, player. The difficulty was reproducing, how do you reproduce his music? But he's, him as a sort of individual, I read a lot about him, mm. seems a sort of larger than life, kind of, almost operatic. I wanted Willard White to, I remember Willard White to play the thing. His agent didn't even get back to us. He's like, it wasn't, wasn't even considered. So that didn't help that we did to find a proper singer, or the right singer for that role. Right. So I think that's what, that was what really interested me. But it's very hard. Also, I was, I'm white and, and the librettist was white. And it was very tricky because a lot of the political things came up as well. Mm. It shouldn't really be a problem, but I think at that point particularly it was a problem. And I felt that that I wasn't sure how I could do it. And I mean, I've talked to other people and directors and they said, oh, that's a really good idea. But it, I mean, I one, one of the things that I was curious to hear your thoughts about was that as far as I can make out, Mingus was a bit of a frustrated composer. Yeah. And that the whole jazz setup was in fact something of a limitation for yeah, you. Yeah, I agree. And, that's and a, yeah. you're someone who's worked a lot in jazz yeah. and with jazz musicians. Yeah. And if I dare say so, you're one of the few people who's actually worked in that niche that, mm. uh, and have brought it off successfully. Yeah. Uh, I just wondered if you thought that that was one of the reasons why you felt sympathetic. Definitely, and movies. also, I mean, I never, obviously, he died um, when I was 18, so, um, but Schiller, Dante the Schiller, who's my teacher in America, knew him very well. Mm. So I was very aware of, uh, of, of Mingus, but yeah, it's still a, sort of one of those projects I wish it had come off, but it, it, uh, the only thing I could do is salvage what I, did because I wrote uh, 45 minutes of it right. over 45 minutes, so it did. It, it, but it, so and Kai's not, it's only 25 minutes, so sure. it's 20 minutes that um, but it didn't work and you couldn't ever use it. No, but it's, it is interesting, mm -hmm. yeah.
John has kind of half stolen my next question, which was about, <laughs> Sorry, Richard. about the reconciliation of elements of jazz and uh, in sort of classical framework. Um, and it can, in the hands of some composers, it can be quite sort of contrived and, and tokenistic, I think. But in your music, it, it feels very, very unforced and natural. Um, and I just wondered if you can say something about it. I mean, about how, how that, that sort of came into your music. Well, the thing is, don't think you should think about it too much. I, I, that sounds ridiculous because um, obviously I care about it a lot. But um, I was a big fan uh, of, of jazz, particularly when I was 18. Um, I became, I, I didn't grow up with it, uh, with, with classical music, but I suddenly became very aware of it when I started at Royal College. And because it was sort of forbidden at Royal College, it also became, I say forbidden, they, they didn't really approve of it. Um, it was frowned upon, uh, which is really mad because it was like, we're talking about 1978, it's not that long ago. But it was sort of, you know, there wasn't a jazz course there. So I, I suddenly got into jazz in a really big way. But the, the, I'm not sure the reason why, I think maybe that's partly why it became very important in my pieces, because my first things I was doing with Ollie Nusson and John Lambert at the Royal College Junior Department and Senior Department were, um, were my first pieces and I was getting really getting into jazz. Um, so what happened is it took me a long time to absorb it, really. Um, I wrote this piece called Night Dances, which has a sort of middle moon, which is quite Miles Davis y. And um, then, then eventually I started working with players. That's, that's when it became a deeper thing because I was working with people, and I sort of, well, the, the scary thing is I was big fans of these people. Um, but somehow it, uh, I mean, I, 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 know, I know what you're saying, but I have actually written a couple of pieces that really don't work because it's, it's always a risk. Mm -hmm. I've got, I wrote a piece with Joe Lovano, um, who's, Joe Lovano is a wonderful sax player, and I think the piece isn't very good. So I think, you know, it's, it, it, it is, it can be hit and miss. Is there a question of keeping your artistic personality intact uh, about getting close to something that you really, really love without surrendering what makes you, you? A little bit, and it depends on the sensitivity of the player. I think you have to be just very careful, and I, I was talking a bit about this today, the kind of composers can be did, I did a little bit of teaching. And, and of course, what you can get is uh, really great people on the premiere, so you, you have great control over who you work with. The difficulty is when it comes to a second performance, and you might get a jazz player who's completely wrong. So the integration of, of the whole thing doesn't work at all. I had that with a guitarist once, um, in Blood on the Floor, and it just didn't work. And so it's always a risk, but then that's the fun thing about it, really. But I think, the, 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 I'm, actually, I've heard this recently from Ollie Nusson, that Gunther Schiller, uh, my teacher, who was very strict and very diff well, really hard on me actually, um, Ollie once asked him what he thought about my uh, things. He was fairly complimentary, but he said that I didn't allow enough space for the players to solo, which is really interesting because I sort of agree with him, although in later pieces I did a bit more, but um, the trouble is I think if you allow too much space then it becomes out of control. So, so it was very interesting that he, that he had this criticism, and I, and I know what he means, but it is a fine balance, and, and I think I think with early pieces like Blood on the Floor, um, there is less time. But then I didn't want them to just suddenly like you know run a mock for three or four minutes, and then it becomes different. Anyway, so it's, it's a big debate. Yeah, yeah. The way the cookie crumbles with this program, um, it so happens that the pieces of yours that we're playing are are all over, well, they're both over to, over twenty years old, and I wondered. To, I remember someone saying that hearing a piece um, from from such a long time. It feels like listening to a piece by you, your younger brother or something like that. But how does it feel at this distance of time? Um, uh, tricky. Uh -huh. <laughs> Which is not very, very nice, really, as you're about to hear. No, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't, there are pieces of mine I really wouldn't want you to play, and I would have been sort of, I would have been here, but I would have been less enthusiastic about mm. hearing it. It's, 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 I'll tell you what, it's tricky for composers, and I'm sure you, you know, understand this, is that when you, when you're in the middle of writing something else, it's really hard because it's confusing. Um, because also there are things that I really like about those pieces and other things I don't like about them. But also um, sometimes I think, well, how did I do that? I don't remember. It's, it's, I forget, like I said like earlier on when you asked me that question, I forget how the, I wrote the pieces. So it, they don't really feel that, I'm not close to them because it's such a long time ago. I mean, Kai was premiered in 1990, uh, this time was in 93, I think. And so this is quite a long time ago. So I think that the, 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 uh, with pieces you like, you sort of have a, like a fondness, but you don't, it doesn't seem new anymore. It's really, it's a very strange sensation and it always seems ungrateful 
because I'm really grateful to the players, you know, because they played, you know, and I heard the rehearsal was great, and Joy, the cellist, is fantastic, you know, I mean, really, it couldn't be better, I couldn't have a better time, and I love working with players, but it's, it's, it's really weird even looking at the score, I, you know, I, all the same things always come up with balance, and I always feel slightly removed from it a little bit, mm -hmm. but so, it's, it's, so it is, I don't know, it's like a distant memory. One more question. Um, talking earlier on today, you, you said you've got to be very resilient to be a composer. Um, <laughs> and I think it's something that might be easily forgotten if you look at people's CVs, you know, they've worked with X, Y, and Z, and it all looks very glamorous yeah. and, and, and impressive. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if you could just say something about some of the obstacles that you've, that you've faced and some of the sort of difficulties on the way. Yeah, well, it's interesting because you're right. It does, I see that with other people I really admire. I think, well, you know, there's just it's been, not, it's not been easy, but it's just, you, you just see a trajectory and you forget the, the, I mean, for instance, in my case, I had a huge amount of discouragement at school. I went to a, a secondary school, um, which I think Ben O'Sullivan, who we will talk to today, uh, it was in Stafford Hope, and I had a music teacher who was ghastly, and she just did not believe in me at all. She put every opposition in my way, and I've gone public on this. I've never mentioned her name, by the way, and I'm not going to mention her name. Not that you know it, but because, um, uh, funny enough, another teacher at the school was still there when she was there, and um, she threatened to sue me, actually, which is very strange. I didn't actually mention her name, but she was um, very, very discouraging. Just thought I was messing around. And so I had a lot of lack of confidence. So when I was studying with Oli Nassim when I was 16, 17, he couldn't believe how unconfident I was. So I, but then of course I got a lot of confidence from Ollie. But what, what I find very interesting about, you know, the, the, there's a lot of pressure about for film composers and it's not helped by, I mean, really fantastic composers like George Benjamin, who's exactly the same year as, uh, born the same year as me, who I admire hugely. But also, he was very young when he had the problems performance and all these things. Tom Addis, all these people, is it puts pressure on composers in a way. And what what you've got to realise is that everybody develops at a different rate. And you could be 40, even 50 when things start to. You know, look at Janáček is a great example. If Janáček had died 20 years younger, you know, he. I mean, there'd be a few pieces, but the, you know, there wouldn't be. So you. you I always feel, and Tippett was quite late, and I, I don't know, I just feel that, that so I, I also, funny enough, around about the time of this silence, and just after Kai, went through a really bad period of pieces when I was in the CBSO. I mean, I wrote this piece, Drowned Out, which was better, but I wrote quite a few pieces that didn't work at all, and, and have been withdrawn. And I think that, I think you just see this sort of things happening, and I think there's like dips and stuff, so, so you, you know, you, you it, it is, it, I mean, I say about resilience, I think you have to really want to do this, what, you know, to be a composer. I think you really have to fight hard. And I think that, that I see that even with some of my students. I think I wonder if they're going to be a composer in 10 years' time. But you can't say, you know, you have to encourage, but, you, you know, it, it's just things are thrown at you and things, you know. And, and it, it looks really, when I'm saying that, it looks like I'm being ungrateful. Um, but I think, you, you know, day to day, um, you know, writing, you know, I write a lot of music, but, you know, people say, well, you write a lot of music, you're very prolific, but it's because I have to pay, I've got four kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to write, you know, and I teach a little bit, but that's, but, you know, there's the sort of practical things I think people don't realise, they just see that you've got these performances and yeah. stuff, but, you know, it's, it's but you know, I think, I think, I always feel this, this really strongly, and I, I know some composers that I know that uh, I really admire is that, that I have this thing is that if, I didn't write music anymore. I'm sorry, if I didn't get commissioned anymore, I'd still write music in my spare time because mm -hmm. that's what I've ever wanted to do from the age of nine. And so I think that with my teacher, this teacher I had, who was and another teacher actually, who I bumped in on to the train about ten years later and, and, and was really embarrassed because um, I'd done a few things and he said, "Well, we didn't know." And I said, "Well, it doesn't matter. You encourage people. You encourage young kids." Yeah. Because you know that's that's what you know. And so whenever I see young composers, and as a, actually a boy here today, he's eight. Um, he's a composer at his junior department. Um, you you just have to encourage because you never know how people are going to develop. And I just I, I'm just very lucky. I had a few key people, and the main person was Oliver Lassen, who just said, "You are a composer. You will do this. I believe in you." And I think that it's very great to have that. And, and not everybody has that. But so I had extremes in a way. So that's Thanks very much. Thank you. Jonathan, um, can you tell us a bit about Rattle His Bones? Yes, um, well this is a piece that, um, just change the topic now, but it's <laughs> a, a piece that's based on a little chorale 
uh, that I wrote when I was here as an undergraduate, in fact, um, but which I felt I never really did justice to. I never got it out of my system. I'm not sure I have even now, actually, but that's what the piece is based on. Um, and I chose to go, I mean, it's interesting about choice of ensembles and going out of your comfort zone. This is quite a stark ensemble. It's four winds, two brass, and sort of rhythm section of bass, piano, and percussion. Um, so no violins. And I'd just written beforehand, or, well, still in the process of writing, a violin and cello duo. So this was sort of everything that wasn't, mm -hmm. really. Um, and I did worry for a while that I'd suddenly shot myself in the foot with that. But I think it's turned out all right and brings out different colours. Um, you know, well, you know, Stravinsky talks all the time about giving yourself a restriction in order to then go further. And I hope that's what's happened here. Um, how many, out of interest, how many instruments did you miss out out of the whole possible ensemble? Well, I think the list I got of the whole possible ensemble then ended up different because I think it was going to be uh, on all fours at that point. Uh, and so the decision may well have been completely different had I known I could get a fuller string section. But it's probably, <laughs> probably for the best it works out that way mm -hmm. because I you know, wrote a piece that you know, otherwise I might have slipped into old, old habits. It does give your piece a completely different colour from anything else in the programme. Mm, well, that's sure. an advantage as well. Mm. well <coughs> however good or bad it is, they sound different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a good start. Mm -hmm. mm. And the chorale it's based on, um, where, does, where does that come from? Um, well, it, it's, it's an original mm -hmm. um, chorale based on an eight-note mode. Mm -hmm. um, I was studying with Giles Swain at the time, who, who loves his eight-note modes and has a whole system based on them. Um, so I had to go with an eight note mode. And it, all it is is it's an E major scale with an, an F natural added in. Mm -hmm. um, but just adding in the F natural gives it this completely different strange colour. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of play around with a C sharp E uh, axis, which is a lot of what the piece is about as well, mm -hmm. um, in a technical sense, as well as the E F sort of tension. Um, but it's, it's very simple, just four phrases, very four square. And you hear it right towards the end of the piece very quietly on piano and some sort of percussion uh, tinklings and um, the, the whole piece in a way leads to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the title Rattle His Bones comes from Joyce's Ulysses, is that right? Yes, well that's where I found it. Mm -hmm. um, it's in fact from a poem um, called The Pauper's Drive which is it's rattle his bones over the stones only a pauper nobody owns. So the idea is that no one cares about this pauper who's died and is having his funeral, uh, his, his coffin dragged through taken through the streets um, but I, it's really it, it's not based on Ulysses in any way it's just the, the sort of colour that that phrase rattle his bones mm -hmm. conjures up mm -hmm. um, it's just a starting point I find it quite helpful to have a title quite early on just to set the tone for the piece um, and I, I often think oh I might change it later but inevitably once you've got that in your mind it's rattle his bones it has to be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um Finally, I'd just like to ask you, do you tend to have a plan for the whole piece before you start, or do you, d d does the piece change shape as you work your way through it, or do you start at the beginning and end at the end, or how does that all work well, out? Well, that's actually something that's very relevant to this piece, because in, uh, I, I would tend to generally set out on a piece and think, okay, I, I roughly know what I want this to be. Um, but the risk is that then you just start to sort of fill in uh, a mould that you've created rather than letting the material go its own way, or rather you know, it's the illusion of the material going its own way, of course it, it, you always impose your will on the material. Um, but with this piece I, I deliberately try to be sort of more general in what I set out to do and, and let the material guide me. And that's why the, the structure actually in this piece has, has come out a bit weird, I'd say. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't follow a, I hope it doesn't follow a kind of standard trajectory um, but there's a kind of pivot point towards the middle. Um, before that, it's, there's quite a long passage of fast music, and then it goes into something else a bit more dreamlike. Um, and I think making it hang together is actually difficult. Patrick Bailey's done a very good job with, <laughs> with making that work. Um, but I hope that also gives the players and the conductor something to what you know, they have to, they have a shape to put in proportion and make work. It doesn't play itself, for better or worse. Um, but it was, it was really a decision with this piece to try and let it go a different way. And, well, you can judge whether it's a success. And that was certainly the, the idea. Thanks very much. Um, John. Um, Richard. Richard. <laughs>
has, has Rilke been a, 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 a sort of um, been bothering you for a long time? <laughs> Well, yes, I, I guess I first read Rilke in translation about uh, 30 years ago uh, and was very impressed and then sort of it went into the background. But uh, not very many years ago, Don Patterson per produced a rather interesting translation of one of Rilke's rather complicated late works called Sonnets to Orpheus. And I read those in Don Patterson's version. And that made me want to go back read, to read Rilke again and to look at the whole sort of output. And uh, he was really quite frequently translated in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. The Hogarth Press published lots of uh, Rilke, virtually the whole of, of his output. And I. I always enjoyed digging around on Abe books to see if I can find sort of original copies, not first editions and so on, but just to go back to some of these rather interesting things that the Hogarth Press published. Um, book of Pictures is a quite early collection of Rilke, uh, but the tone of the poems I've always just found very, very intriguing. and. One of my frequent habits is to try and put together sequences of verse, uh, extracts sometimes from verse, which make up a kind of narrative of my own design, as it were. And uh, I've done that in this piece. Please don't ask what the narrative is. You'll have to work it out for yourselves. Um, but I'd, I also, with, with this work, wanted to do something slightly odd, and that was that I've got seven poems, but I've made them, the, uh, the overall structure is five separate movements. The first two poems run together as one movement. The second poem, which is called Loneliness, is entirely unaccompanied. So that is a rather strange thing when the ensemble just has to sit there. The third movement has got another two poems, Premonitions and Storm. And then the fourth movement, I thought, I'll balance the second movement by having a, a sort of song without words, so there's no singer. And then at the end, a couple of autumnal things, because for me, Rilke is very much to do with a sense of valediction, if you like, and autumn is uh, a prime sort of season for that kind of thing. And the peace ends with the leaves blowing away. So that's it. Thanks very much. Um, talking of valediction, um, Mark, looking at your, um, looking at your, across your output, there are a lot of pieces of yours that are memorials mm -hmm. or, or elegies for, for people who have passed. Yeah. Um, could, is that just the way the way it happened, or it's just it, it's a sort of response, really. It's sometimes you know, it's, it's, it's in a way I. I do this with birthdays as well. It's sort of that, it's a bit trite saying that, but it, it's mm -hmm. quite often the pieces I write in memorial in, for memorials and also for birthdays are not commissioned, so they're very spontaneous uh, pieces of work. Um, so they're not to a deadline. It's just a natural response, and I love doing that. It's also the, it's great for birthday presents particularly because if you've not got any ideas about what to buy somebody, <laughs> you just you write a piece. And of course, it's great because they really are grateful. But I mean, although it takes you time, it's much more personal than you write the right. Uh, but I mean, for memorials, it's very different. But it, they, so what happens is like they, they end up using, well, they start off as piano pieces very often because that's the easiest way of presenting it. And I give it, you know, I do it from not necessarily played at the funeral, although there have been a few cases where I have been for funerals. Um, and then, of course, a bit like your chorales in a way, they become, a, you become sort of like the chorale we use. They become slightly obsessed, and you've got this little bit of spontaneous work that then becomes about the person who died, but also it can feed into a larger work. So, so I tend to, you know, have a few of these pieces. The the, the, um, the first one I did that I got, there was a piece for Toro Takamitsu um, called Tune for Toro, and I think it's sort of from then on it's become, you know, I mean, unfortunately when you get to fifties, um, the more and more people die, you know, like that. So there's, it seems to be more. I mean, I had like, six people who died within two years. Um, two, three of them were very young. Well, two, two of my age, and 
well, the one that I did for Simon, uh, for, for the LSO, John Schofield's son. So there's a couple of really tragic things, but I, I, it seems to be sometimes the only positive uh, way of dealing with it, mm. with grief, and, and it always seems like it, um, appropriate for me. Although it's very private, it seems something that I can mm-hmm. make as like a little gravestone or memorial for somebody. Mm. More broadly, um, do a lot of your pieces start at the piano? Uh, yes, um, uh, although I worry about this. I had a teacher, John Lambert, um, who said uh, you should never write at the piano, which always made me laugh because um, there's quite a few good examples of composers. Wagner, Haydn, Javinsky, that's pretty good for me. Um, and so I, I think you should never say don't do that, although I think it is dangerous to, just to write piano music that... Yeah, so I, I worry about this in the sense that I think it's good. For, I mean, I worry about this and also for composers using technology, you know, using surveillance. Um, I think you can see that quite often. And I think it's quite good to train your ears. I know that as I get older, I do more away from the piano, um, funny enough, because I think that's because you're just familiar. You're just, the more you write, the, hopefully the better your ears get. And so I, I, I'm sort of doing less and less uh, at the piano, but I think that I do still find that, you know, it's the Stravinsky thing of, Thing under your, th- I'd, I'd still like that tactile thing of being in constant in contact with the sound. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, so I, I still do do that. But uh, I, I never write at the straight of the computer. I think I mean I might change things mm-hmm. once a base if I'm doing a fair copy. But I, I did that when I used to write because I would, I started off from college as a copyist. So I had a re- I've got a very neat. Well, I did have a very neat hand, but I don't do that anymore because nobody <laughs> writes you know neat scores. So actually, when I do the birthday or the funeral, I quite often copy my neatly. That's the only time I ever write music out neatly, which is weird. It's, so nice, it's, it's nice to see music written out by hand, isn't it? That, yeah. that looks different from anyone else's hand. Oh, it's, 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 yeah, that's what I get excited about. I mean, I can't afford it, but you know, my sort of dream would be to write, you know, to, to buy you know, an original for It's certainly like a piece of manuscript with composer signatures on, you know, because it's, it's their personality. But unfortunately, that's all gone now. Mm-hmm. Computers, which is sad. Mm. Can I ask um, John and, and Jonathan? Do you do you work at the piano, and, and what's your kind of relationship with technology? <laughs> <laughs> well, my relationship with technology is of fairly recent vintage, as someone in the audience there knows. Um, I've now got Sibelius, and I can now use it, but uh, I can't. I am actually experimenting with very very small pieces that I'm writing straight onto the screen. Um, but I know this is going to sound absolutely ridiculous, but personally, I get a physical pleasure from actually writing music by hand. And I really miss that with the, the click-click and uh, you know, putting it all into Sibelius. But uh, obviously, it's a wonderful thing to be able to make these fair scores and then you know, click on the corner and get your parts out of it without... Uh, a lot of laborious copying. But having said that, in the days when I used to have to copy out everything by hand, like Mark says, you get into a kind of routine of working. You really know your piece when you've done it. And if you then copy out the parts, and you see each line, line by line, you get a real feel for the inside workings of it and in a way that you didn't at the time of actually writing it out as a full score, so I, I kind of miss all those things. As far as the piano is concerned, I, I use the piano to sound out things. I'm, in a ro- I'm a rotten pianist, as anyone who's heard me play knows, so I can't invent anything very significant for the piano, but I always test out sonority of, of spacings and chords and so forth at the keyboard to see that uh, what I think they're going to sound like is probably reasonably accurate. But yeah, I mean, I, I like the sound of music rather than the, uh, and that too, ra- rather than, um, you know, just doing it all on a screen and, and the horrible noises that Sibelius makes. <laughs> how, how about you, Jonathan? Yeah, likewise, always by hand. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, increasingly so. When I sort of started as a teenager, I just did it into the software, but now I find I, I can't which I, I don't think is particularly typical, but I, I can't think of the music when looking at the screen, because it's literally in a box. Yeah. Um, and you have to, and this is something I say to you know, my young students, is c- convince them it's actually easier 
to write it by hand because when you start a computer file, you have to choose your time signature, you have to choose your instruments. On a piece of paper, you can do whatever you want. You can mm. write it backwards and scribble on it. Um, and that's part of the, the process. Um, and I hate having to sit down and, and typeset it on the computer mm. because obviously it sounds terrible on the playback, which you've got to learn to uh, distance yourself from. Um, but also it's just, you know, it's not, it's not the same thing. You, you have to typeset it now. Mm. Um, with regards to the piano, um, I too am a terrible pianist. Um, I, I do write at the piano. Um, my first sort of stabs at composing were um, but I used to bash through musical theatre songbooks all the time, reading the chord symbols, and that's perhaps worrying me <coughs> still where my conception of harmony kind of comes from, is, is bashing out triads at the piano. Um, I hope it's gone, gotten a bit better since then. Um, but it's, it's very much about the physical act of playing, writing, and this is something else I uh, say to students, if you can get the connection between the physically making the sound and the notation and how you hear it in your head, if you can get that all working together, which is really hard, um, then you're onto a winner. But mm -hmm. it just takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, but trying to do it with the computer is it's like trying to you know, dance with your leg in a cast. You know, mm -hmm. you, you're only going to get so far and you'll probably trip up. Mark, one, we're slightly overrun, but one yeah. final question if I can, um, and that is, um, what are, you, what are you doing now? What are you working on and what's, what's coming up? If <laughs> um, I, I, I'm a bit strange as a composer. I'm always way ahead of any deadline, so I'm sort of running out of things to do. <laughs> um, I've got a few... Uh, well, I, I've, I've written a, a children's opera for Royal Opera for next year, which is based on a um, book by Neil Gaiman called Coraline, which is a, quite a famous cartoon. And that's sort of, I'm still sort of fiddling with that. Um, I've also written a piece for Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra, um, which I've been working on, which is set on a Ukrainian text, because uh, Kirill Karabits is, is conducting. Um, but my next really big project, um, which unfortunately I can't really talk about um, in terms of, and it's not because I don't want to, it's just because it's difficult, because um, the subject's not, we haven't got total permission to it for everything, yeah. um, is for the Royal Opera, I'm writing a main house uh, opera for 2020. So it's quite a way, but I, I have to start it quite soon. Um, so that's my next sort of big thing. And the thing about opera um, is that it's, for me, it's like all consuming and it takes a long time. The children's opera was every chamber, so although it's a full evening, it's sort of, sort of less work, but that's what I'm sort of like working on. And that gets me to 60, so I <laughs> can't think too much ahead of that. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank thanks, you. thanks to all of you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.